Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about estimating hydrocarbon volumes in oil and gas fields, also on drill prospects. So, hydrocarbon volumes are estimated using the volumetric equation, which is hydrocarbon in place is the gross rock volume multiplied by the net to gross ratio, multiplied by the porosity, multiplied by the hydrocarbon saturation, multiplied by a formation volume factor, and I'll explain what each of these terms are. The recoverable volume is a hydrocarbon in place multiplied by a recovery factor. So I'll explain what all of these things are uh, bit by bit by bit. So um, gross rock volume is the amount of uh, rock that's, uh, that uh, the thing contains. Net to gross is the amount of rock that is of reservoir quality. Porosity is the portion of the rock which is basically made up of holes. Hydrocarbon saturation is the portion of the porosity that contains hydrocarbon because it'll always contain some water. Volumetric factors are to do with um, expansion or contraction of oil or gas when you bring it up to surface conditions. Uh, you may also put in a fraction for non-hydrocarbons, particularly in some gases which have a lot of nitrogen or CO2. Sometimes that could be in the percentages rather than just you know minor fractions. And then recovery factors. Now, in probabilistic estimates, for example, in software uh, GeoX, which is uh, now on Bach Lumberger or Crystal Ball, each element is modeled stochastically, so you model them by probability distribution, and you have output range for both in place and recoverable volumes. Generally, that's put in as P90, which is low, P50, which is median, P10, which is high, and a mean output. Uh, some uh, people, particularly in America, tend to refer to P90 as high and P10 as low, so please, if you're using those terms, do put in what you're saying. So just for probabilistics, you have a distribution of gross rock volumes, distribution of net to grosses, distribution of porosities, distribution of saturations, distribution of the volumetric factors, and that gives you the hydrocarbon place ranges. Then you multiply that by distribution of recovery factors, that gives you a recoverable resource estimate. Uh, obviously, these have particularly different types of distribution, and I might talk, make a separate video on how what these things are and how they actually work. So gross rock volume is the volume um, of rock above a potential contact. So you have the top reservoir surface, a base reservoir surface if you have one. Alternatively, you may use a variable thickness. If you don't have a base reservoir surface, you can map seismically. And then a hydrocarbon water contact. Now for a discovery where you know what hydrocarbon water contact is, that uncertainty is eliminated. For prospects, obviously you don't know where the hydrocarbon water contact is or whether you've actually got one. So you model a range of them. And uh, once you put all of that in, you'll come up with a gross rock volume. So just some terms in here. So this is a structure. So there's a cross section. That's a contour map. Crest is the very top here. A contact, potential contact. Spill point is here because hydrocarbons, uh, they'll migrate outside the trap at this particular point. So they'll spill out into another area. So that's called the spill point. Any hydrocarbon water contact is either at the spill point or above it, depending on seal capacity. Um, now, it's also an issue in terms of column height, which is the height between the gas water, the hydrocarbon water contact at the crest, and in certain uh, situations that because the hydrocarbon contact and the crest height is very large, that may breach seal. So I've got a separate video on seals and how they work. So we've got our gross rock volume, which is normally the biggest uncertainty we've actually got. But the other things are also important. So here you have a diagram uh, from Delic Drilling, um, which shows what net to gross ratio is. Now, this is a gross rock. So you've got in there both sand and shale. And then here you've got one, two, three, and four. These are quality sands. And then the brown bits are the shales, which don't have any capacity to contain hydrocarbons. So you need to eliminate them from the volumetric equation. And that's where you use net to gross. Now, net to gross cutoffs are provided by a petrophysicist. Uh, some people don't like net to grosses. Uh, they prefer to use a much more bulky porosity. Or if you're build, dealing with individual sand bodies, you can eliminate that because effectively that is uh, that is there. Um, typically, net to grosses can range from anything from one to something very low. Uh, so they're always between zero and one in terms of uh, fraction or between zero and 100%. Uh, porosity is the amount of holes that are contained in the rock, which contain hydrocarbons. Now, these are some thin sections on the microscopes, the blue uh, stained areas are the holes, which have been uh, stained with the resin. 
Porosity decreases with depth, so as you bury the rock, it gets squished due to compaction, due to the weight of pressure of the, of the rock above it, and it'll eventually decline. So if you've got uh, loosely packed grains, you know, like you take some beach sand in your hand when you're in the, in the beach or building sandcastles, that'll give a porosity of 47.64%. But reservoir rocks tend to range between 33 and 10% in terms of porosity. If you've got porosities less than 10%, they tend to be very disconnected and they don't tend to really work. Now, in some types of rock, physically limestone, porosity can be created through diagenesis, which is a chemical alteration of the rock. Or it can be destroyed through cementation, which again, where cement builds up. Could also have porosity induced by fracturing and various dual porosity systems where you have uh, hydrocarbons contained in, the, in normal porosity and then linked up by using fractured porosity. And it's correlated with permeability, which is the rate at which hydrocarbons will flow or fluid will flow but the relationship isn't exact. In terms of hydrocarbon saturation, now uh, the holes between the rock will always contain some water. And there's a fraction called the irreducible water saturation, which is as low as it will go. Uh, when you have a fully water wet system, you have uh, uh, water saturation of one, which means there's no hydrocarbon. So the hydrocarbon saturation is one minus the water saturation. There are various ways of measuring water saturation. They're normally measured using resistivity logs, which measure electrical resistivity because water is electrically conductive and oil is electrically resistive. And there are various equations such as Archie, Waxman, Smith, Sandinese, etc., that measure that. Also, you can use nuclear magnetic resonance logs, which can distinguish the immobile and immobile waters, i.e., bound waters. Water saturation tends to be related to porosity. Generally, tend to have low porosity area will tend to have higher water saturations. Now, volumetric factors. Now, when you bring your oil to surface or your gas to surface, it changes. Oil shrinks and gas expands. Now, oil uh, tends to shrink um, because uh, you know you get less heat, and some uh, gas tends to come out of the solution of the oil as well, which tends to dissolve things. So that's called the gas oil ratio. Uh, black oil, which is uh, most normal oils, has a formation volume factor of 1.2 to 1.4. Uh, uh, so you divide that to 1 over 1.2 or 1 over 1.4. Volatile oils, which tend to have uh, more gas associated with them, tend to shrink a lot more. They can shrink by up to half. So they tend to be 1 to half to 1.2.2. Best to consult your reservoir engineer about what are volumetric factors to use and use a wide range when you don't know. With gas expansion factor, again, if you remember high school physics, Boyle's law, uh, pressure equals one over volume with Charles' law, volume equals uh, uh, constant times temperature, uh, PV equals NRT, if you remember all that from high school physics. So that's the same thing that happens with, uh, with gases when you bring them to the surface, they'll expand. And the expansion is dependent on the pressure difference between uh, Reservoir conditions and surface conditions, also temperature obviously plays a part. And um, best to consult your friendly reservoir engineer, they'll provide you with, uh, with an appropriate gas expansion factor. And gas condensate ratio is the uh, condensate gas ratio is the amount of condensate that's dissolved in the volume of gas. So liquids will drop out of the gas when you bring it to the surface, particularly if it's a rich condensate, there could actually be quite a lot of very valuable liquid. And I have a video on natural gas liquids which uh, explains some of that. Recovery factors. Now, this is to some extent the more controversial part of it. Um, it's the portion of the in-place volume that may be recovered during a field's lifetime. Now, it's a bit of an artificial construct. Generally, what tends to happen when you know what you when you have a field, you build a reservoir model, uh, build a simulator model, run a simulation, produce production profiles, and then some of those production profiles is what you'll actually have value of. Then you uh, divide those by the um, by the, divide the hydrocarbon place uh, by, the, by the, the recoverable volume, and you'll get a recovery factor. Um, now, obviously, it's a bit of a challenge when you're at the prospect stage, so you tend to estimate things. So these are some typical recovery factors. Now, for a depletion-produced oil field with artificial lift, poor one will be 10%, medium will be 20%, good one will be 30% in terms of reservoir quality. If you've got pressure support, such as uh, water injection, 20% for poor, 35% for mid, 45% per good, 50% is exceptional. But it happens if you've got a really good reservoir. Dry gas, which will include compression uh, to basically suck the gas out when the natural uh, pressure isn't quite there. 55% uh, poor, 65% medium, 75% good. And for wet gas, said 50% poor, 60% medium, 65% good. Again, 
really kind of want to talk to your resident engineer about this one, but these are some rules of thumb that give you an idea. So where do we get these inputs for undrilled prospects? Uh, gross report volume comes from seismic mapping. So you've got your top structure, hydrocarbon water contact levels. Again, those are a bit of a guess. Top structure isn't a guess. Top structure, you know what you're talking about. Uh, in terms of uh, sand body thickness, if you're using the area depth method rather than using direct method, i.e. when you can't seismically see the base, again, the geologist will provide you that from uh, regional modeling. Uh, the geologist also provide you uh, net of gross for the sedimentology. You can try to compare models, adjacent wells, etc. Ditto for the porosity. Again, depth of burial, sedimentary facies, etc., etc., etc. Saturation, you look at petrophysical models, to some extent, guesswork from the porosity model. Uh, formation volume factor, the reservoir engineer will give you that, and they'll also give you the, res uh, they'll also give you the recovery factor. Uh, key thing to bear in mind, though, with prospects is your range wide enough. You know, most people put in ranges of parameters, you know, low case and mid case and high case. Uh, but look backs tend to uh, show that pre drill estimates, post drill results tend to show, tend to be a bit not really quite there. Post drill tends to be a lot smaller than many pre drill estimates, maybe because people um, have too narrow a range, maybe they skew the range to the higher side. Um, and gross rock volume tends to be overestimated. Basically, that needs to be looked at. So you need to keep a full reasonable range for all the prospects that are there. So a little bit about different types of uh, scenarios where you put volumetrics. So when you're doing a prospect, probabilistic estimate, which is what I've been talking about in, the, in a program such as GeoX, multiple scenarios, you know, limited constraint because you haven't got there. When you're at appraisal stage, um, you may still do volumetric probabilistic estimates. Um, again, when you're not sure, you're still appraising. Um, you need to have a wide idea. You may build map-based models, so Petrel, Kingdom, you know, basically one scenario with significant constraint when you've got multiple well data. And then when you've got more data and you're getting further in your field, a um, geological static model, something like Petrel, Skewer, GoCAD, etc., model several scenarios, you know, have well data to put in there. And then put that into reservoir simulator, such as Eclipse, and run limited scenarios. When you're doing development, you're in the Petrel Eclipse stage, building an integrated geological model. And when you have production, you've got history match. So you've got real production data, which you can then alter your model to fit. Always fit, always alter your model, not your data, to ensure that so you have an understanding of what's going on. These methods are complex, take a long time. We know we're talking weeks, months to build a fully, a fully fitted reservoir model. These things are relatively simple. This can be done in days. Obviously, the longer you are in a exploration production cycle, the more complicated your models will be because the more valuable decisions you need to make. So just to sum up, this is how hydrocarbons are calculated. Hydrocarbon in place because the gross rock volume, net to gross, porosity, saturation, volumetric factor. A recoverable volume, hydrocarbon in place, times the recovery factor. So thank you very much. Please like, subscribe. See you in the next one. Video on reserves, video on risking, which I'll link to in the uh, screen. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.